All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our course titled A Scientific Apologetic, Diving Deeper into the Evidence for God. To begin, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is uh, Angel Shea, and I am one of the leads of our Pittsburgh church. Here is our team, and this is my family. Uh, we have two ministries in Pittsburgh, one at CMU, our Claces group, and one at Pitt, our Make New group. Thank you so much for praying for us. We're in our third year of our um, church planting, and it's been amazing to see how God has been at work. I'm part of the class of 2002. Here are my peers. Um, the one with the arrow, that is Richard. He's one of my co-teachers here in our course. Uh, we're scattered all over the place. Uh, this is representing the different campuses that we are. We're in Taiwan, East Coast, West Coast, Central Coast. And we have the distinction of being those who've turned 40 this past year. I know some of us look at more than others. We like to joke that for some of our peers, their age is finally caught up to their face. A bit more about my background. I grew up in New Jersey and I loved science. I loved bio, chem, physics, CS, you name it. I was a guy that did math competitions, science Olympiad. And so I decided a nerdy engineering school, that's what it was going to be for me. And so I ended up going to MIT, studied bio. And for me, I'd grown up in church, become Christian during youth group. But college was that time where Christianity became more personal to me, where I made my lordship decision, start to grow in zeal to reach out to the lost and reach out to our campus and build the church like many of you guys here. At the same time, I was growing my love of science. I did my undergraduate research with this guy named Robert Horvitz. He studied apoptosis, programmed cell death. I actually didn't know how famous he was till later on when I was um, interviewing for medical schools. I'm like, wow, everyone knew him. That's because he studied apoptosis and these worms called C. elegans. And actually he helped discover the process of apoptosis. I actually studied one of the proteins, said one and said two under him. And in 2002, he won the Nobel Prize for, the, for uh, medicine. And so I like to tell people that's one of my famous anecdotes to say, this is my claim to fame. Back to my story, as, as I was getting more involved in the science field, I started to hear a lot of comments against God. Right? People have said that when you believe in God, that must mean you're ignorant. And as I was doing my MD, PhD, my advisor was actually very adamantly opposed to intelligent design, the idea of a God, all those kinds of things. He had grown up Catholic, but then, then since become disillusioned to God. And I also remember as I was talking to my lab mates, we'd get into all these conversations. They'd be open to Christianity. But at the same time, again and again, I'd hit up against this barrier, the sense that science disproves God. And so that sent me on a journey to learn more about this whole area, to, to bolster my own beliefs, as well as to help those to push past this barrier. And there's actually a ton out there. I'm not, by no means an expert. I'm still learning. But I hope that as we go through the material of this course, it'll help bolster your conviction that God is real. And in fact, many areas of science do point to that. Because here's the thing, the barriers to belief and to science, in, in science and all those things, it wasn't just back 10, 15, 20 years ago when I was there, but no, it's still big within our society today. And I just wanna walk us through this article in Barna. It's titled, Atheism Doubles Amongst Generation Z. And Generation Z, these are people born between 1999 and 2015. That's essentially most of the college students, the high school, middle school students that we're ministering to today. And what did it show when it looked at them? When it looked at this population, it found that with Generation Z compared to prior generations, the percentage of atheism has gone up from 7% to 13%. And those who identify themselves as Christians or Catholic, that has gone down. And why? Why is that the case? So they went ahead and asked them, what are your barriers to faith? And this is what they said. The first excuse being, well, I have a hard time believing that a good God would allow so much evil or suffering. And I think this is a big issue, something that I face on the campuses all the time. And it's a reason why we have to talk about these. Why would a good God allow evil? And of course, there's a good place to learn about that. It's not here, but it's something we should definitely bolster our faith about. I think the second reason is because Christians are hypocrites. And, and man, that's such a sad reason for a barrier. And that's been the case throughout all time. And that's why it's so important that we as Christians live out what we believe. But then the third one, I believe science refutes too much of the Bible. And I think this one is something that we can do something about. And if we're going to reach our generation, we have to raise the, to raise the plausibility structure for God and open door the door for the possibility of them believing in him this is an area that we need to combat and really talk about. And so that's what we're gonna do in this course. So some of the aims for our course are this, uh, twofold. First of all, I wanna get you more familiar with some of the arguments that we present in our normal science of faith talk. Things like fine tuning, big bang evolution. In our outreach talks, we usually don't have time to talk about things like this, to go more in depth about these theories, but people do ask about them. And so we wanna hit upon these topics. 
We'd also like to touch upon some areas that we don't normally get to talk about in the midst of our courses. It's beyond the course of 40 minutes, and they're also a bit more controversial, but we wanna hit on some of those as well. We're actually building the course as we go, so feel free to give us some feedback, some suggestions of what you'd like to hear, and we can go more in depth about those things as well. So I'd like to start today is to just do a broad overview of this topic of science of faith. How did this debate come up in history? What were some of the main arguments for and against it? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a walkthrough of history in the 19th and 20th centuries, both in philosophy and mostly science, looking at the demise and then the reawakening of two main arguments, the design argument and the cosmological argument. I know for some of you, this might be a little bit of a review. For others, it might go pretty fast. Don't worry. Don't worry if you don't fully understand it, if we don't go that deep into it. This is just an overview. We'll have time throughout the rest of our course to really hit these more in depth. And so here we go. All right, so up until the 19th century, there was a really widespread belief in God. Science was seen as a tool to better understand and appreciate God's creation. But then things started to turn. And in, 19, in 1799, Pierre Laplace, he of the Laplace Transform, the Laplace Equation, he presented his book titled Treaties on Celestial Mechanics to Napoleon. As he sought to explain the origin of the solar system as a force, as a product of natural gravitational forces. And legend has it that when Napoleon read it, he summoned Laplace to him and he said, Mr. Laplace, they tell me you've written this large book on the system of the universe, have never mentioned its creator. To which Laplace replied, well, it's because I had no need of that hypothesis. And while we don't know if that actually happened, I think it accurately depicts the philosophical attitude that many of people in science had during the 19th century. And there started to be this turn in history from a theistic account of how the world was to then a more naturalistic account due to many developments in science. And it pertained to these two arguments that I mentioned before, the design argument and the cosmological argument. And so looking first at the, the design argument, what was it that led to its demise in the 19th century? Well, the design argument, what is it in the first place? Well, classically this argument states that when you look at nature, it's highly ordered, has complex features. And when you look at that, it has the qualities of being designed, right? Highly ordered plus complex features. And being designed seems to indicate some sort of intelligence that would have put this into place, some sort of design. And, we, and a classic example is, is the eye and its complexity, right? When you look at the eye, the anatomy of the eye, you look at the light as it comes in through the eye, what happens? It has to go through the cornea, through the anterior chamber, through the iris pupil, focused in the lens, and then onto the retina. That's only the first step, right? Because once it gets to the retina, what happens? Well, look at this. this. The light passes through the cones, the rods, gets transduced into electrical signal, and then through the optic nerve, finally an image into the brain. Or you look at all that and look at, wow, it's complex. All these things have to work together to process the image. And it must have been designed by some sort of intelligence. But then in the 19th century, this argument started to come under attack by David Hume. In his book, The Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, he said that the design argument depends on a flawed analogy. He acknowledges that true complex devices like watches, for example, they do derive from intelligence, right? They're so complex, specific, and things of nature do have a, a pretty similar thing, like the eye, in that they depend on an integration of different parts that are separate and specifically configured. However, he also said that machines and then um, organisms, they also don't share other properties as well. For example, reproduction. And how do you account for those things? And he says that based on experience, experience tells us that organisms come from other organisms. And so he argues that the real analogy we have to make is that our organisms, who we are, must have descended from a more primeval organism, like some sort of giant spider, for example, and not some transcendent, transcendent spirit or mind. So philosophically, things start to change. But actually, what really struck down the design argument was the emergence of an increasingly powerful materialistic explanation of nature and what seemed like design. And this came about through Charles Lyell. In the 1830s, he published a book, Principles of Geology. And what he did through this book is to explain Earth's most dramatic features, the mountains, the canyons, not as from the hand of God, but as a result of slow, gradual changes over a long amount of time. And this book started to influence scientists and actually reached to this guy, Charles Darwin. Lyle had asked the captain of the HMS Beagle to search for erratic boulders, and he gave that captain a copy of his book. This, copy, this book, captain then gave it to Darwin, 
And Darwin started to read it voraciously, and he started to apply what he had learned from Lyell to the findings that he was seeing all around him. And out of that came his book, The Origin of Species, um, which sought to show that the blind process of natural selection acting on random variations over time could result in the forms of life and complexity that we see on Earth without any divine intervention or guidance. And so Francisco Ayala, he's a prominent um, evolutionary biologist these days, he says, the functional design of organisms and their features would seem to argue for the existence of a designer. It was Darwin's greatest accomplishment to show that the directive organization of living beings can be explained as a result of a natural process, natural selection, without any need to resort to a creator or other external agent. And so as a result of these discoveries, design soon became relegated to a matter of subjective belief. You could believe in God, but you could just as easily assert that nature and its laws existed on their own. If you believed in God, it was actually more through the eyes of faith, not science. At the same time, we also start to see the demise of the cosmological argument. And so what is a cosmological argument? Well, it's something we're very familiar with, the Kalam cosmological argument that William Lane Craig talks about. It's just that whatever began to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, and therefore the universe has a cause. And that cause must be some sort of uncaused cause or God that exists outside of the universe. But then they start to be challenged philosophically by Immanuel Kant, who said, well, how do you know the earth, the universe is, all, is was caused? Like, what if it were an infinite universe? Then if it were, there would be no need for a first cause. On top of that, the idea of this infinite universe was reinforced by the science of the day. Newton's famous theory of gravitation says that gravity is a result of the product of masses over the distance squared. And so all the universe bodies in the universe should universally attract. But here's the thing. If that's true, then all the stars should start to gravitate toward the center, and the universe itself should collapse. And so either the universe must be collapsing or expanding to offset this tendency to collapse. The one thing it could not be was static. But back then, that was the idea of the day. If there was God, the universe was there and has always been there. And so in order not to abandon his idea of gravity, or the idea of a static universe, Newton proposed that matter was evenly distributed over all of infinite space, such that every star tugs at every other star with equal force, almost like doing tug of war and everyone pulling with an equal amount of weight so that nothing else moves. And for Newton, that was appealing for theological reasons. Since God was infinite, space-time should be as well. But this, of course, un intentionally undermined the idea of God as a concept of the infinite universe provided scientists with a powerful reason to reject the cosmological argument. Because if there's no beginning, then the universe does not need to have a cause. And in the words of, words of Carl Sagan, the universe is all that is, was, or ever will be. And so what happened is toward the end of the 19th century, that many scientists, philosophers, even theologians have seen science and God now standing in overt conflict with one another. Not only that, or they could be actually mutually exclusive, not intersecting in any way. And what it did is it allowed people to be intellectually fulfilled, atheists, and it fueled a scientifically based materialist worldview, opening up the opportunity for many to be able to reject the notion of God in the universe. But what happened is during the 20th century, the tide started to turn. It became evidence in cosmology, physics, biology that started to mount and show a different story. In fact, supporting the idea of a finite universe in reopening the question for design. And so what happened? Well, looking first at the reawakening of the cosmological argument, it really started in 1915 to 1916 with this guy, Albert Einstein, when he unveiled the general theory of relativity. According to this theory, massive bodies curve space so as to draw objects nearer to themselves. And so what happens, this meant that all bodies over time should congeal unless they're continuously counteracted by some sort of expansion of the universe. And what this implied is that the universe itself could not be static, but was simultaneously expanding. And this also suggested that the, if the universe was also of finite duration, that's racing outward from some sort of initial beginning in the distant past. Einstein realized this, and he didn't really like those implications. And so what he did is he introduced this arbitrary factor called the cosmological factor, or the repulsive force, that was counteracting its expansion so that his theory 
the, the expansion of his theory predicted so that he could maintain a picture of a steady and an infinite universe. But this couldn't last for long because in the 1920s and 1930s, Edwin Hubble in Southern California discovered that the Milky Way was just one of many galaxies spread throughout the universe. And as he was looking at these galaxies, he realized that actually, when you're looking at them, they were receding away from ours because the light from these galaxies was in the red spectrum, indicating that they were moving away from us. Right, just like the classic Doppler effect we have when a police car speeds by you and moves away. And furthermore, when we looked at the rate of expansion, it was directly in proportion to the distance from us, as if the universe was going in a, a, a spherical expansion from some sort of big bang. And all this pointing to the fact that there indeed was a beginning. But soon after that, there were other competing theories, and cosmologists tried to formulate alternates to this theory. In the 1940s, Hoyle, Gold, and Barney proposed something called the steady state universe model, where the true, the universe was expanding, but it wasn't expanding from one point in time, but the universe was always there. And it's just expanding in a way that new matter is being formed to fill the gaps as it's spreading outward, outward, outward. And there was actually no need for a singular beginning. But in a few years, what happens is that this model had to be discarded because in the 1960s, scientists from Bell Labs, Penzias and Wilson, they found something called cosmic background radiation. And this was radiation that's predicted to be a remnant of a, some sort of huge explosive force as well as something that was very, very, very hot. And that would not have been the case in steady state theory. In addition, when people started looking at the ages of the universe, they found that being that rather than being a radically different ages, that would have been the case with steady state theory, right? And if it's producing more and more galaxies as the universe expands, what they found is that almost all the galaxies cluster in a narrow, range of ages. And so no longer was the steady state model held true. And so the scientists turn and say, okay, the Big Bang might be true, but did it really have to have some sort of creator? Or could it in fact have been something called an oscillating universe, where there's a Big Bang where things expand, and then they start to slow down and they decelerate into a big crunch, and then a Big Bang, a big crunch, on and on and on again, by some sort of unknown mechanism. But as scientists look at this more detail, they start to realize, no, this wouldn't really hold, right? If you think about the laws of entropy, the energy requirement required for it to expand and then contract, no, this theory seems to be pretty untenable. On top of that, there was a big breakthrough in the 1970s by Stephen Hawking and Roger Penrose. And as they were studying the theory of general relativity, they showed that if you extrapolate back in time, the universe had to start as a singularity, a singularity before which there was no space, in no time. And in fact, it implied an absolute beginning of time before which there was no matter, time, space, or energy. And so the evidence for God, for the evidence from science again pointed to the existence of some sort of first cause that have existed before the universe, before matter, before time, in order to set the creation of this universe in motion. Also during these, the 20th century, we also start to see the re reawakening of the design argument. And in, in a big way, this came about as we looked closer and closer at the universe. And as we looked at the universe, we start to notice all these different constants that were fine tuned for light. And this is the fine tuning argument that a lot of us know really well from Course 101, which William Lake Craig talks about. And there's this famous picture, how all these constants are balanced as of all these things were on a razor's edge. And the classic analogy of this is if you were to stumble upon some sort of universe creating machine where all these different dials were set at the right parameters for life to form. But they don't have to be, right? At any moment, you could spin these dials any which way. And yet the moment you do with a slight alteration, what happens? The universe that supports life ceases to exist. And yet for some reason, all the dials of our universe are set exactly the right values to support life. And so people looked at this and they said, for example, Paul Davies, there is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. Stephen Hawking, looking at these different things, he said, the remarkable fact is that the value of these numbers seem to have been very finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. And so what are we trying to do? Well, scientists look at that and they try to come up with different theories of how to explain this apparent design in the universe. And the most popular argument seems to be the chance explanation. That if you're given enough chances, we could be able to explain how this universe that we're in got its exact parameters for life. 
But Oxford uh, physician Roger Penrose argued that actually the probabilities are too high to just get it by chance. Right? Take one of the parameters, that of phase space volume. Right? That would have been 1 to 10 to 10 in the 123rd power, more than the number of elementary particles in the entire universe. And so how much more improbable all the constants necessary for life to be in the range that they are? Now, there are enough probabilities in this universe. And so what happened? Well, scientists say, well, can we create other universes to create more chances? And so out of that came this theory of the multiple parallel universes, of which we happen to be in the one that supports life. And this was made really popular nowadays because of the Spider-Man, right? Back the multiverse, all those kinds of things. And it's kind of a hard theory to talk about because we can't see it. We can't detect these other worlds, so it remains unknowable. But there are issues with it, right? And one of those being namely this universe generator. Like, where did this thing come from? This thing looks complex, this specific. In order to generate all these universes, what created that? And then there's also some other difficulties. As you look at the explanatory power of this model versus the Big Bang, it really lacks in a lot of that. And we'll get to that in a future, gen a future lecture. But as a result of these things, they start to note that in the hard sciences, there start to be a revival of natural theology taking place. Design argument in the field of biology. Well, actually there, it's been a bit tougher. Biologists do acknowledge that there's apparent signs of designs in biological systems, but they insist that that's because of naturalistic mechanisms, that these things through natural selection, random variations, that they can account for all of what seems to be designed in nature. But I think over time in the 20th century, there's been more and more data that's made it increasingly improbable for biological systems to just have arisen by chance. One of those has to do with this concept called molecular machines. For those of you who watched that awesome animation by Harvard titled The Inner Life of the Cell, it gives a good representation of what goes on in every cell. In this case, it's the extravasation of the white blood cell from the bloodstream into an area of infection. And these molecular machines strongly resemble machines designed by human engineers. And Michael Behe from Lehigh University has taken these discoveries and then proposed a model that's titled Irreducible Complexity. And he uses this example of a mousetrap and then also the parallel in biology of, of flagella. And he shows how complex systems are built upon a series of interacting parts. And if just one of these parts were missing, like if the spring were missing, the whole thing would fall apart. And so to imagine this thing coming from a series of gradual changes that are advantageous, that would be highly improbable because it requires the presence of all of these different parts to actually work and do its function. Also during this time, people start to have a bunch of other different discoveries, a big one being the structure of proteins. Back in Darwin's times, proteins were thought to be just simple, regular structures. But starting in the 1950s, biologists start to make a series of discoveries that cause this view to change. Fred Sanger, he determined the sequence of insulin in 1951. And he showed that the proteins are made of non-repetitive amino acids, similar to an irregular beads on a string. And later on, scientists discovered that these proteins are not just in this form, but actually they fold into a 3D structure that's very, very complex. And their structure is entirely dependent on the sequence of amino acids. They have to be the right order in the right place in order for this protein to function. Francis Crick, who discovered DNA, likened this to some sort of linguistic text. You know, just as a text depends on the right sequence of orders, of letters on a text, so does a function of amino acids. Change the order, misplace the letters, and then things change drastically. The function changes. And so the scientists were left wondering, what was it that was directing this complexity, this specificity in these proteins that they could fold again and again and again? And they realized it was too complex to just happen by chance or just to be a result of the different sequences of amino acids themselves. Right? How do you get it again and again and again? They needed some sort of information within the cell that was constructing these highly specific structures. And that's what led them to discover DNA. In DNA, they found that these four nucleotides, A, T, G, and C, they held the information necessary to direct protein synthesis. That in fact, these letters, these sequences were not random, but their very order was essential for life. The coding regions of DNA, they have the same properties of the sequence specificity and complexity that we saw in the amino acids, as well as even written codes, computer programs. And the sequence of nucleotides, they function much like a computer program or based on that code, you get some sort of function. In fact, Bill Gates, he looked at DNA, he himself likened DNA to a computer program, except that was far more advanced than anything we have ever created. And so that leads us to then the question, 
where does all this information contained in the DNA come from? What explains the complexity and specificity intrinsic to each cell that then leads to the proteins and everything else that goes on? Well, scientists have tried to explain it by chance, chance-based models, but they failed because the specific information in each protein or gene exceeds all the probabilistic resources in the universe. And then so people looked at that, okay, well, maybe it can't happen just by chance. There's not enough time in the universe. And so what about some sort of natural selection, some sort of prebiotic natural selection, in the middle of all of that, right? Again and again, through chance, you can form the right sequences. Well, this has a problem, right? Because in order for natural selection to happen, you have to carry the traits to generation to generation. You have to be self-replicating. But the very elements of the self-replicating system that we know of today, which is DNA and proteins, that's the very thing you're trying to find the discovery of. Like, how did those things form? And so that's hard to explain. And then when you try to explain the content of DNA, just as a function of its physical and chemical properties, intrinsic properties, that doesn't work. Right? Just as the chemistry of ink does not explain the exact sequence of letters on a page. Right? It's not the chemistry, it's kind of something else extrinsic to it, outside of all this, the physical chemical properties that's putting these things into place. And so this idea of complex specified information contained in DNA is what points to potential intelligence. Right, imagine this, say you open a newspaper and you see all these letters in precisely the right sequence as to give words, contain meaningful information. And you look at that and you wanna find what's the source of all this? You're not gonna look at the chemical composition of ink. You're not gonna look to some printing press that put it out. No, what are you gonna look at? You're gonna go to the writer, the person who wrote this. That's where you're gonna go. Because the, the sequence, the complexity of all that information has to be through some sort of intelligence. And Dembski put it in his words in Design Inference. And he showed that systems with sequences that have the joint properties of being highly complex and specific, that these things always result from intelligent causes, not chance or physical chemical necessity. And I think we know this intuitively. Right? I saw this this past week as I was looking at CNN. They saw this flower field in the Netherlands. And imagine you're walking and you see this. You know, instantly it's not random. Right? There's complexity, there's specificity here. There's some sort of intelligence, probably some gardener that planted and arranged it, even if you're not around when he did it, even if you're not there to witness it, and nor do you see him. And similarly, when we look at DNA, proteins, all those things, the specifically arranged sequences and information contained in these things suggest the past action of some sort of intelligence, even if we cannot observe or see the agent. And so when we take all these evidence together, they seem to construct a means to view the possibility of an intelligent designer. And using arguments from epistemology and logic, a case can be made that the evidence from sciences actually provides support for and not against the existence of God. Indeed, as Psalm 19.1 says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. And I think that's what we start to see as we study these things. And so that's it for me that for the overview. I know it's pretty fast. There are things I didn't go into much detail. Hopefully it gives you a broad view of the landscape and the different ways in which science and faith have been uh, supporting and at odds with one another. And we'll look at a bunch of these topics in more detail throughout the course. And so I'm looking forward to our time together.